Hello, everyone. Can everybody hear me? I can. Okay. Uh, I see a few yeses. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending upon which part of the world you're joining us from. Welcome to this uh, webinar co organized by the Water Channel and IIT Delft and being supported uh, in this case by Deltaris. This is a holiday season in several parts of the world, which also means this is the beach season in, in those parts of the world. And rightly so, you should go to the beach and you should enjoy. Uh, but as you lie on the beach sand, we would also like to ask you to think about the several other functions that the beach performs, apart from providing you pleasure. Um, this beach is the first line of defense for the community living next to it when there's a coastal storm. Uh, it is the ecosystem that supports so many coastal life forms, uh, so many coastal plants and animals. And the sandy beaches, the beaches, the coasts, they also define the lifestyle, the lifestyles and cultures of coastal communities. Being so important as they are, um, sandy beaches need to be preserved and protected. Um, and to preserve and protect them, they need to be understood well. Uh, we need to have a good understanding of the different sources that feed sand uh, to the beaches and what helps and uh, disrupts the supply of uh, the sand to uh, the coasts. How are human activities affecting this process and how, how, how is climate change affecting it, if at all? So we are lucky to have with us today Prof uh, uh, Professor Dano Rulwe from IHG to discuss all of these questions that you might have. Uh, who has 33 years of experience in coastal engineering and research. Uh, you have seen his detailed bio on the landing page from where you came to this webinar. So, uh, so I will not dive into details about his uh, work experience and it will be a very deep dive because uh, his experience is really extensive and it should take a lot of time. But um, what we are definitely looking forward to is a presentation from Professor Rulwig that will help us improve our understanding of coastal dynamics, uh, some of the threats that our coasts face today, and what tools are out there to track these processes and, um, and tools that will help us develop and target appropriate uh, responses. Uh, especially, we are looking forward to he hearing about shorelines, which uh, uh, is a tool under development. Uh, and which uh, I was made to understand can be used not only by scientists, but also by engaged citizens uh, to see how human impact has altered coasts, to see it and uh, to ascertain what can be different strategies to adapt to it or to fix it, mitigate it. Before I hand things over to Professor Rulbank, I would like to emphasize that uh, this is an interactive webinar. We would like this to be a very interactive session. We encourage you to share your questions and comments, which you can do uh, by typing into this chat box over here. Um, and uh, we will uh, address your uh, questions and comments during the Q&A session, uh, which will be <coughs> about 30 to 35 minutes into the uh, webinar. So um, without further ado, I would like to uh, thank, uh, hand things over to Professor Rubin. Uh, please take it away. Okay, um, welcome everybody. It's uh, great to, uh, to see so many people uh, have tuned in. Uh, many friendly faces I know, uh, and a lot uh, that I do not know. So uh, let's uh, let's go. I would like to acknowledge my uh, co-authors uh, of uh, of this uh, these studies: uh, Bas Huisman from Del Pares, Ahmed, my PhD student now, before ma master student. Uh, Johan Reins, a colleague, and Mohamed Gonin, who just finished his master's thesis also on, on this development. Um, first of all, a bit of motivation. Um, I've been uh, able to, to visit many places along uh, coasts in the world uh, that, that have this kind of, of problems. Uh, here we have a dramatic situation uh, in the lee of a port at, uh, in Benin, in, the, in West Africa. Um, you see houses and, and, and infrastructure falling into the sea. Um, we have uh, sometimes uh, migrating uh, tidal inlets, like here in Grand Laou, in, in Ivory Coast, where, where this, uh, this spit uh, used to be uh, extended uh, 400 meters to, to the east uh, just a couple of years ago. And, and 
they are now uh, they've almost completely abandoned uh, this spit now. Uh, here is a near oh, this is going too fast, but uh, uh, near the near the Volta mouth, you see this road uh, really uh, being being endangered. Uh, now it's a, a, a big rock wall and and it's protected, but there's no beach anymore. Um, this used to be a very affluent area in uh, in Ivory Coast. You see the swimming pool there. It's not doing very well at the moment. And again, this is uh, the result of a uh, of a large port project uh, for Abidjan uh, in, uh, that was carried out in the in the 50s and 60s, and and that has uh, well robbed this area of its uh, of its sand. Um, even in very affluent uh, uh, touristic areas, like here in Playa del Carmen in, in Yucatan, beautiful uh, hotels where the lawns are manicured, and uh, but the beaches are, are taken away. And people will tell me that it's uh, it's the, the the sea level rise, but uh, it's very likely that this was a, something else entirely, uh, because sea level rise doesn't manifest itself at this kind of time scale. Um, so what are the causes here? Well, I'd like to, to uh, mention a very important one, and that is that, that uh, it's surprising maybe, but an incredible amount of sand and gravel is used for construction, and it's, it's taken away from areas that can really not afford this. Uh, on the top right you see the uh, 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 a whole sand spit that was excavated for a port project in, in Ivory Coast. Um, on the right uh, bottom, you see many of those kind of holes in, in countries like Ghana, uh, and one such a hole can build you a house. Uh, so that is, is, is very nice, of course, uh, but uh, then, then uh, uh, if you build a lot of such holes, people think, well, the, the sea will fill it in again. Uh, and that's that's true, but it will go at the cost of of coastal erosion. And on the bottom left, you see uh, uh, just one picture taken from a hotel room where you see four sand ships uh, transporting sand in the in the Mekong Delta. Uh, and and Mekong Delta that is 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 heavily uh, threatened by erosion. And, and, and due to all kinds of, of upstream things, but at the same time, 28 million cubic meters per year is dredged from there uh, uh, for, for construction purposes. So that is a, a very important factor. We also, uh, so the, the, the amount of, of all that mining is equal to all the sand that is brought to the coast by rivers, but also the sand that the rivers bring is reducing enormously. Uh, so in the Yangtze, for instance, there you see the, the blue line is the, the average flow, uh, which is pretty constant, uh, but the sediment discharge in the red line is showing an enormous uh, decline. Uh, and the Volta River, for instance, I was mentioning, uh, they're, they're, they built uh, the, the Okosombo Dam and, and it has, has reduced all the sand output to zero. Um, wait. Uh, here's just uh, in, in, in Ivory Coast, Ghana, Togo, Bine, the, an overview of some of the, the big uh, uh, interferences with the sand system, uh, the, the dams that, that were built and the ports that block the longshore sediment transport. Uh, on top of that, we have many cities that, that also have very severe uh, subsidence, uh, cities and even countries. So some examples in, in Jakarta is a very well known uh, where, where it can go to up to 10 to 20 centimeters per year uh, in such a way that, that they're now seriously considering moving the whole capital to another place. Um, but also in the Mekong Delta, at uh, many places, there's very serious subsidence. Louisiana is, is a well-known case where an enormous amount of land has been lost over the last century. And also, I've just returned from Bangladesh, where this is uh, also quite a serious uh, problem. 
uh, it's mostly uh, due to groundwater extraction and uh, anyway it, these effects really often trump the uh, sea level rise and this can have an, in, uh, an important effect on the shoreline erosion now so the first lesson is I mean so far the things you saw did not need climate change uh, so um, uh, what are we doing now Oh, I was on the wrong button, sorry. So, we don't need climate change to mess up our coasts, but of course it helps, eh, because what we uh, are facing now, we, used to, we were getting used to relatively modest increases of uh, sea level, like 50 centimeters by 2100, but now, um, it's more and more likely that it, it, it is in the range of a meter and um, and there's a, a recent uh, data that suggests that that the uh, sliding of, of glaciers on Antarctica and Greenland may accelerate this uh, this sea level rise maybe by another meter in, in 2100 so if we're talking about two meters of sea level rise then we're really in uh, in big trouble um, so, and apart from sea level rise, there's other effects. Huh? We can have a, a change in the storm intensity and uh, 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 storm surges, wave climate can change, but definitely we will um, look at, at many impacts of, uh, uh, of, of climate change. Here's an overview of the, the potential climate change effects on coast by my colleague Roy van der Singer. And uh, we'll see, especially if we look at the, the lower three parts, then, then we're looking at the more, uh, more slow evolution of the coast that, that then threatens the, the safety. And so the, the, the coastal erosion, of course, threatens the houses that are directly on the beach, uh, but it also uh, reduces the safety of, uh, of the, the hinterland. Uh, because if you cut into the dune or dike that is protecting your land, uh, then, then you get more overtopping and a higher probability that, that your defenses will fail. So in the rest of the talk, I will uh, talk mostly about this long-term evolution, how we can model this and, and how we can predict and, and make sure or, or uh, counteract uh, this erosion. Um, yes. Okay, so I'll focus on these effects. I have to see my mouse is now and then sliding. Next. Yeah, oh, okay. So maybe we can play this uh, this video. So this is a Ria Formosa in Portugal, very large and dynamic system. Uh, here's a, an animation from Google Earth Engine, something I would really recommend you to have a look at, to look for the time-lapse videos on Google Earth Engine. You can find it on Google. You see this incredible dynamic tidal inlet that is moving over hundreds of uh, over kilometers and now and then is is uh, relocated so how do we simulate such a complex system maybe we can go back to the presentation so we see here we have this house on the on the bottom left it, it is not there anymore it's been eroded away and we see now and then we have big dune erosion we also have dune growth so how do we model the future of a complex uh, system like this? Um, and uh, it, it's, it, this area is, is tide dominated, and, uh, but the beaches are really wave dominated. It has migrating inlets, and the whole system is about 100 kilometers uh, in, in, in length. So uh, you have a, a wide range of scales. We need some clever, uh, uh, simplifications to, to simulate the, the behavior of such a system. 
Um, maybe we can show the animation. I just do. Just to show uh, the the incredibly uh, intricate uh, tidal uh, flows, and and uh, they also, uh, of course, have a big impact on how these uh, tidal inlets uh, behave. And we need to, uh, but we would love to to do the long term simulation with a complex model like this. But it's simply at the moment it's 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 not possible yet. So if we go back to the Presentation. So, if we go to much larger time and space scales, then uh, then uh, the resolving the surf zone is 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 really a problem because you have a system that's a hundred uh, kilometers long, but you need to resolve the surf zone with a grid size of twenty meters or so, and that's just not not an option. So we need a, a coastline model, a, a simplified model that, that can deal with this, um, uh, but the existing ones are not good enough. So, oh, this goes too fast. Um, so existing models such as, uh, as Unibest, LTCL by Delta, LitPAC by Genesis, uh, by, by DHI, Genesis by the Corps of Engineers, and, and uh, Cosmos Coast by the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, they have very nice uh, capabilities of, of uh, explaining wave-driven longshore transport and how the coast uh, reacts to that. Uh, but they are only capable of having relatively small changes relative to a reference coastline. So no fun processes like moving spits and islands and migrating inlets. Um, so this is what we do want. Oh, sorry, I'm just going back. Um, so an, an example of what such models can do is a relatively simple case of uh, the, uh, a port blocking the, the, the longshore transport and how on the left side of the port you see how it is uh, 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 the, the accretion is, is simulated and on the right hand side you see the erosion and you see different models that are all in some way or other able to, to represent this process. Um, here's a, a, a very recent model by Sean Fitusek and others um, in, uh, in, in California. Very, this is as far, uh, uh, I think, as, as you can take this coastline modeling in the, in the, the classical sense. Uh, including data assimilation and long-term predictions. Really uh, a nice model. But still, uh, the coastline is moving on rails. It can only go back or forth. Um, on the other hand, there have been models by Andrew Ashton and others uh, uh, that were grid-based, but still uh, relatively uh, simple. Just uh, driven by, by longshore transport, uh, based on very simple transport formulations. But that model is able to, to simulate very interesting coastal instabilities, uh, like you see on the bottom uh, right. Uh, you see in the, in the, the middle uh, at the bottom how that model is able to, to, to predict those kind of instabilities. But it was never meant to be a, an engineering model. So the standard models, they have a lot of, of uh, experience in engineering. The coastal evolution model and similar models are, have much richer behavior, but they are only used for schematic system studies. And what we'd like to have is, is a, a model that, that combines those things. Uh, now, how... Uh, uh, First of all, how does a, a standard coastline model work? You represent the coastline by a series of points. This is a, on the left, there's a plan form uh, uh, image of, of the coastline. We have a reference line, and, and then uh, the, the, we have S along that reference line and N in the normal direction, and these points, uh, they can move the, the, the squares, they can move back and forth. 
Uh, and the angle between those uh, points is, is computed in the middle. And there we compute the angle between the waves and the coast. Uh, and if there's a, uh, and then on the top right we see the launcher transport again in plan form. And then below that we see that the profile is supposed to shift back and forth in a uniform way. And uh, well, then the sediment balance is, is solved. And we get this kind of like in the bottom right uh, for Imaiden, we see the, the, the coastal evolution as predicted and as, uh, as observed. Uh, and you see that we can do a reasonable job of, of representing that with a classical approach. Now, what is the difference with what we do now? If I can get there. Sometimes. Okay. The difference is we just left out the reference line. Yeah? So we take the coastline as a string of points, yeah? but the coastal orientation is just determined by the by the two adjacent points, as you see here. And the and the cross shore uh, so the, the seaward or landward uh, movement of the coast is determined by the transports that you see on either side of a coastline point and the normal direction that the coast is moving in uh, is just determined by the direction given by the two adjacent cells. And then we solve this relatively simple uh, equation which is the, the longshore transport gradient. We have a, a term uh, related to relative sea level rise and we have a bunch of possible sources and sink, sinks uh, due to nourishment or, 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 or sand mining or crossshore transport. And we, yeah. so this is the, the, the same equation again. So we have a, a, a profile slope that plays a role in the relative sea level rise, etc. Um, and if we write this in numerical terms and it's just a matter of, of some bookkeeping of the transports and the, and the, and the uh, locations of the, of the uh, coastline points in absolute uh, space. Now, what is important, uh, so we have a bunch of different transport formulas, but there's still, I won't go into the details of those, they're still very simple uh, uh, formulas, the important thing there to show is that transport is a function of wave height and wave direction only, and it's a maximum at around 45 degrees of relative uh, uh, wave direction. Now, how do we represent the coastline? The, the other nice thing is that we can have an arbitrary number of coast sections, including islands, uh, and uh, we can just uh, click those on a map or download them from Google Earth or, or from other uh, sources. And we can have a number of polylines that represent the coastline and we also have a, a, a bunch of uh, structures that can either block the longshore transport or block the wave energy. Um, uh, wave shadowing uh, can take place because of other parts of the coast or because of structures, as you see here. So we run along the, the, the coastline, look at where the waves are coming from, and if there's anything between us and the waves, then the waves are shielded. And so sediment transport goes to zero. This uh, illustrates this, so the shadow can be because of the structure or because of another part of the coast. And there's an important uh, part here of, uh, of uh, the, the, the numerical scheme, that is that, uh, that a central scheme will not, uh, will, will turn unstable when the wave angle gets beyond 45 degrees, then a, a physical instability kicks in uh, that will tend to create uh, undulations or even uh, spits. Uh, and with an upwind scheme as devised by, by Andrew Ashton, 
uh, we can uh, make sure that our numerical scheme uh, can deal with this. And then you can do this uh, kind of things where when you start with a, a certain uh, a corner in your in your coast uh, and maybe you can play this uh, this video and then you see that this can develop a coast you you may be able to see that there's all individual uh, coastline points that uh, that are, are are constantly being regridded uh, and the, not only does the spit develop, but it also shadows the, the coast on the right so that there is an erosion happening there. Okay, so let's get back to the presentation. It can also it can also handle uh, uh, islands that can move and, and that can weld to the coast again. If we can play this. So the island develops the spits, it, they grow to the coast and, and then they can break up again. And so this is just a matter of some some uh, geometric uh, uh, routines that, that are called every time step to, to, to check what is happening with the coast. Yes, can we go back? So, we now have a, a, a very interesting project in, uh, in, 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 in Saint Louis, in Senegal, together with uh, Del Paris where a small breach was made uh, to reduce lagoon water levels in 2003 and this, this breach grew to five kilometers width. We can see it on Google Earth uh, if we play the animation. So, you see here, it started four meters wide and, and now it's, it's six kilometers and several villages were actually destroyed uh, in this process because the, the, the coast behind the, 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 the barrier uh, uh, was totally not uh, prepared for, uh, for being uh, on an open coast suddenly. Yes? Let's go back. Now we are asked to uh, uh, to predict what will happen, uh, well, how this happened, and and also what will happen in the future with uh, with this. So uh, to support that uh, that proposal, I made this little animation here, very schematic. And there you see that the the had the. The spit, especially on the south, is 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 being diverted by the wave-driven currents. It is shedding these bars, and this looks quite a bit like what we saw in the Google Earth movie. Even even though it's, this is just a schematic simulation, at the moment we're trying to to do this in a more serious uh, way and actually uh, do a quantitative uh, comparison with what uh, what has been observed. Uh, if we go to back to the presentation, mm -hmm. there we go. So here we have an animation of uh, of on the on the left you you, you see a model uh, uh, calibration, and on the right you see the observed from satellite imagery. Uh, you see the observed uh, uh, similar, uh, uh, evolution. Can we see that uh, animation? No, the next one, sorry. Yeah, so what you see here is this speed um, is, is extending to the south. The, the blue line uh, indicates uh, uh, the, the river uh, keeping that, that mouth open, otherwise it would immediately weld to the coast. Uh, and, and you see that this uh, indicates that at least a past situation of before the breach in 2003 
Uh, we have been able to, to simulate that quite nicely with this, uh, this model. And in the moment, at the moment, I'm struggling to, uh, to uh, get the situation right uh, for after that, uh, the, the breach, uh, which is uh, uh, quite different again from what was happening in the past. And, and this is what we are really trying to understand. Why did it behave so differently the next time? Okay, let's go back. Here's an, another famous example, the, the, the sand engine or the sand motor that uh, uh, was, was built to, to uh, nourish a large part of the Dutch coast while having an interesting coastal evolution and nature values. Um, the, uh, uh, a lot of uh, research has, has been done on this uh, this area and, and, and a lot of model simulations also have been carried out with very uh, complicated models. Um, this is, is how uh, the shoreline S can, can represent this. Can we show the animation? No, it's the next one. Yeah, going very well. Oh no, it's, uh, we missed the one in between, I guess. Uh, sorry, I think I failed to upload that or something. Oh, that's not a, no problem, it doesn't, doesn't that. matter. Uh, just look to the presentation. Um, because I have the... Here, here you see how the model uh, uh, has done over the first five years of uh, evolution of this uh, system. And you see that it uh, that is able to, to, uh, to simulate this, this growing of the spit towards the coast and then, then closing it off huh? and, uh, and, and evolving further. So let me quickly go. Uh, so here's uh, the... Uh, model showing the same kind of undulations as in uh, in the original paper by Andrew Ashton. Uh, so you see that out of small disturbances, these uh, these uh, shoreline instabilities grow, and they uh, grow into the large flying spits. Uh, and and these are actually uh, yeah we can go back. Thank you. So these uh, end up uh, looking uh, very much like like uh, the ones uh, we see in nature. Um, another uh, case which I, I uh, uh, which Ahmed uh, did after implementing a diffraction in the model is is the, the uh, case of El Gamil in uh, in in Egypt, and uh, yeah, if we play that. you see very uh, interesting development and this whole scheme in the end being filled up with uh, uh, with uh, sand uh, much as uh, as happened in reality yes let's go go back I th so if we uh, have a, a lot of uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, topography in, in, uh, in, in the large scale uh, depth, like a big uh, canyon, then the, the waves can, can refract uh, and, and they can lead to uh, variations in the, in the shoreline. Uh, I will have to go quickly. Um, so this is the, the case of Port Bouet, where you see this, this coast orientation looks very weird. Huh? It, it doesn't, you have to find a reason why this, uh, this is. And one of the things is this, on the left you see this, the, the, the dark blue is, is a very deep area called the Trou Sans Fond, uh, the hole without the bottom. And on the right you see in the colors how the wave direction changes because of this, uh, this uh, canyon. And so uh, where it's yellow, the waves turn to the east, and where it's blue, the waves turn to the west. And, 
And because of this, uh, if you take that into account, then with refraction on the bottom, on the top left, uh, you you reproduce this kind of causal orientation. Whereas on the bottom uh, left, uh, the, if you do not take that into account, the cause is just very straightened out and, and, and isn't represented well at all. Um, uh, Mohamed Konim has just uh, improved the modeling of groin bypassing in, in a very nice way. On the uh, top left, you see what the original scheme was doing with it, and, and now uh, on the bottom left, you see how uh, how the uh, uh, cost uh, is showing very uh, organized way of of sand bypassing. Um, Let's uh, skip this animation. Uh, I do want to uh, to have some time for a discussion. Um, the conclusion is now that we have a fun uh, a new model, and it's a prototype for the next generation coastline model for engineering purposes. Uh, uh, it's available in open source MATLAB code. Uh, the address is shorelines.nl. Um, uh, and uh, it's it's great for explaining coastal processes, and it's easy to add more processes. We are still working on a, on a number of, of things. For instance, the coupling with the dune foot was just uh, uh, created uh, by Mohamed uh, Gornin as part of his master's thesis. Uh, Ahmed uh, is is working uh, in his PhD together with uh, with the University of Algarve in in Faro on barrier overwashing and rollover. Uh, we're working on tidal inlet migration. Uh, Ahmed has implemented wave diffraction and is making that uh, uh, usable for any, any uh, hard structures. And we're looking at the large scale effects of wave refraction together with Bas Huisman at Del Pares and Caspar Mudde and, and, and myself. And we're happy to, to be involved now in, in case studies in Portugal, in Alaska, with the support of the U.S. Geological Survey, in Senegal, for, based on this, uh, this uh, Nordic Fund project, and uh, Angola and, uh, and the Netherlands. Um, so the conclusions is, uh, we have uh, this new approach to modeling. It's available at shorelines.nl. And it can run in an interactive mode, as I will illustrate with this little video. Unfortunately, I cannot do a live um, uh, live demonstration now because I'm not uh, I'm not in control of this uh, uh, of this presentation. Let's say I don't have a laptop in front of me. But this was what I was doing during a, a conference. Uh, listening to the talk but uh, so you, you see in interactive mode you can just click a, a, a coastline like this uh, and uh, you click your right mouse and then you go to another coast section so i'm clicking an island here an island is defined if you close this, the, the polygon and then i can uh, introduce some structure here there's a, just one groin and then I simply start up the, 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 the model or it starts by itself when you're done and you see that in the simulation we see the groin blocking the sediment transport we see the island uh, uh, deforming and moving towards the coast we see a spit uh, developing so there's a lot of interesting things that are happening and and really a lot of of kind of causal situations you can just simply simulate so it's very nice for classroom exp explanations and for for a little practical hands-on exercises so that's uh, can i go back to the presentation So, so I'd like to uh, end up with handing the 
the session over to you and say what would you like to add um, what cases could you bring uh, what could be the ambition of a model like this and how would you like to use it uh, so uh, I'd say uh, open the floor for for questions uh, yes thank you so much Dano um, we have opened the floor for questions now but we have been receiving questions uh, throughout your presentation and I'll bring them up one by one uh, to start off a question from from Rick Eric, uh, which is uh, which wave height would you recommend to use uh, 0.78 H for example if you have a wave propagation using Swan is this question clear Um, yeah, well, th this depends on the on the sediment transport formula that you use, but most of them are based on the H and not uh, the spectral uh, uh, significant wave height, uh, and and so that that would then uh, be what you what you use. And then internally, this can be converted to, into the the wave height at at breaking, uh, but. Uh, um, yeah, usually uh, in the simulations I showed so far. We just use the offshore uh, HM naught wave height. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, question from Maya Hosseini is: Is this model useful when sea level decreases, like Caspian Sea? Yeah, that's an interesting uh, question. Um, I uh, so the way we we can in introduce both sea level rise or sea level uh, decreasing. Is through uh, the Boone rule, uh, which is in fact saying that if you have a uh, one meter of sea level rise, you have one meter divided by the slope of the beach. Uh, uh, of uh, uh, so, for instance, if the beach is one in a hundred, then then one meter sea level rise would lead to a retreat of one hundred meters um, uh, everywhere along the coast. So it's it's like a constant source or sink term. And, and retreat would be the, treated the same way uh, as, uh, as sea level rise. Uh, and of course, near tidal inlets, the situation is a bit uh, more complicated, and you would have a source or sink due to the, 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 the sediment that needs to uh, go in or out of the, the tidal inlet to, to reach a new equilibrium. OK. Uh, the next question is from? F. Sancho, who asks, has a comparison been made on the performance slash prediction of shorelines versus classical one-line models? For example, on the simulation of the coastline evolution for the sand motor. Um, yes, we uh, well, of course, we 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 did the the, the usual uh, uh, Pell consider and the the, the, the the standard analytical tests. Uh, but also the sand motor I showed uh, the, the, uh, the the animation uh, or the, the, the simulation result. Uh, Bas Huisman has has done extensive uh, uh, simulations of the of the sand motor uh, with with Unibest uh, CL, and he he got it uh, quite uh, quite right. The only uh, point is that. Uh, um, you cannot do this this spit development and merging with the coast, so you have to somehow, uh, uh, yeah, uh, start after that has happened, um, and uh, also uh, sometimes you get these uh, instabilities at the coast uh, that that uh, in in our case we can can accommodate, but in. Uh, in the case of Unibest, you have to suppress it by some numerical means. Okay. Um, question from Jean Lindsay, who asks, in what way does the shoreline model differ from other models, uh, such as Delft 3D and X Beach, for example? Um, yeah, so uh, Delft 3D and X Beach are two or three dimensional uh, models, so they uh, uh, they actually re resolve uh, the, the whole two-dimensional uh, wave and current and sediment transport pattern, uh, but they are enormously more uh, computer-intensive. 
like this, the simulation of the sand motor over five years takes 15 minutes, uh, and and it would take like a month uh, on a, on a, on a, on a big cluster where using uh, Delft 3D and XBeach. Uh, so that that is really, uh, of course, they are much richer uh, in 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 uh, uh, in processes, but. Uh, not necessarily also better at predicting spit growth and so on. Okay. Uh, what are the lateral boundary conditions used, for example, in the Egypt example? Um, well, there's a, a, a number of, of options. You can just fix the coast or you can fix um, the coastline gradient, or you can impose a known uh, sediment transport rate. Uh, in, I think in the, in the Egypt uh, case, I think the lateral boundaries were probably some distance away uh, and probably just uh, just fixed. Okay. Um, question about shorelines, I suppose. Can you upload an image on the background and then construct the shoreline nodes by just clicking over the image shoreline? Well, this is um, um, this is something I would love to do to uh, to to make a, a really professional user interface uh, for for shoreliners. What you can do uh, this you can do in Google Earth, uh, and uh, you can click the the shoreline or you can uh, import it from Google Earth Engine, and then you just have to manipulate the, the, the resulting coordinates, maybe uh, transform it to a UTM or local grid. Uh, uh, so this, this involves at the moment uh, some, uh, some handy work. If anyone a bit handy with MATLAB or used to modeling would be able to, to do it because in the end, all you have to give it is two columns of, of X and Y coordinates, uh, and, and you separate the different coast sections by not a number, uh, num, num, and then uh, uh, that's, that's how, how it can be, be imported. Uh, but this, there is no professional user interface at the moment to, to do that. But yeah, it, it, it's quite doable to make it. Uh. I love it when people would make it. Um, Aureli asks, uh, there is no consideration of the cross-shore profile, right? Uh, no, that is, uh, that is assumed to, uh, to be uh, constant uh, uh, in time. Uh, so the shape of the cross-shore profile is assumed to be constant. What, of course, does play a role is the active uh, uh, Profile height, uh, so in, in in that sense that the, the profile shape can play a role, and that uh, you can play a bit with that profile height. For instance, a creating profile would typically uh, have a somewhat smaller uh, profile height than an uh, uh, than an uh, than an eroding one because the eroding one will definitely take the the the, the dune with it, uh, but. Uh, but yeah, no, uh, there are possibilities to include cross-shore behavior, uh, as for instance is done in this COSMOS model by, uh, by the USGS, uh, where they take the, let's say, seasonal variation of the beach profile into account. Uh, so if your coast is like that, which it isn't in Holland, uh, but if, uh, if it is like that with a typical summer and winter profile, then you can uh, you, you can add a, a, a process for that based on the wave height. Mm -hmm. um, Arash asks, he has a question about um, what, we show, what you showed in slide 34. How is the back side of the trench developing without current effects? Uh, yeah, uh, that's very interesting. So that, uh, that simulation was done entirely without uh, any uh, current effects, and also uh, apparently was not needed to uh, uh, to include, uh, let's say, a migrating inlet and, and how it keeps the the inlet open because the, already the waves had a very large tendency to to make the inlet much wider, uh, and then the the the, the, the current. Uh, 
did not uh, did not do much. Uh, so this is a uh, yeah an interesting observation. Um, uh, in the case where you have the, the narrow uh, inlet uh, migrating along the coast, then this this current effect is is totally dominating the the behavior. If you wouldn't have it, it would the whole thing would immediately uh, merge with uh, with the coast behind it. And uh, uh, but in this situation, um, and we're still trying to figure out exactly why, um, the, the current apparently did not play a very big role. Um, Jean Lindsay asks, if shorelines can be applied in tropical islands surrounded by fringing reefs. Yeah, that's uh, very nice, uh, Jean, um, to... Uh, I think in uh, you're thinking of Rodrigues, for instance. Um, I uh, I think so. Um, what, of course, in this case, it is important to have a, a, a two-dimensional wave model that will provide you the the, the waves as uh, broken and refracted by the by the by the reef. Uh, so. Uh, because that, that shoreline S does not have that capability, but we, we do have a, a, a possibility to couple with Swan or with, uh, with uh, uh, an own two-dimensional uh, refraction model. And then when you have the wave climate behind the reef, then you can certainly look at how the, how the, uh, uh, how the coast uh, uh, behaves, for instance, if you have a seasonally varying um, uh, wave climate, uh, then you often see that these, these sandy islands on, uh, protected by a coral reef, uh, how they, that they, they, they move back and forth uh, and, uh, and, and, and can erode and, and accrete uh, uh, as a function of the, the seasons. Uh, and I think that that should be perfectly possible to, to, to simulate. Uh, the next question is from Sheriff who asks, what is the resolution of the wave climate you have been running? Um, in other words, how long does it take to run one year of daily wave conditions? Um, yeah, I think um, the, the, the typical, it depends a lot on the, on the, the spatial resolution that you, the time step depends on the spatial resolution uh, to, the, to the power two. And so uh, a, a 100 meter resolution uh, needs four times smaller time steps than a 200 meter resolution. So if we run typically with 100 or 200 meter resolution, then your time step is in the order of days to maybe weeks. Uh, so uh, it's not a huge extra effort to run daily wave conditions. Uh, hourly wave conditions would really slow the thing down. Uh, but, uh, but if you take, let's say, every day you take a, a good representative wave height uh, and, and period for that day, uh, then, then that is uh, perfectly doable. And uh, for instance, uh, Mohammed uh, and, and, and Ahmed have been uh, doing those kind of uh, realistic simulations. Yeah. Uh, can we specify a given stretch of the coast as non-erosive, uh, like in a coastal revetment? I hope I pronounced that right. Yeah. 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 No, certainly. So you can uh, you can just uh, define a structure uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, so you just click uh, another polyline or, or provide another polyline with all the hard points in, in the coast that will either block the wave uh, propagation or it will block the longshore transport. Uh, and also, uh, yeah, so what you will then get if you have a revetment, uh, well, if it, obviously the coast cannot erode further than that, but if there's, let's say, a sand wave coming, there's a supply of sand uh, that will be, be transported in front of that, uh, that structure. So yeah, uh, I'm sure we can uh, refine that process still by gradually making the longshore transport a function of how far the beach is uh, in front of your, your revetment. But uh, 
but even in the, the, the crude way it is implemented now, it, uh, it will work. Mm -hmm. Uh, have we considered bypass effect before filling the fillet back to the groin? Uh, the groin, yes. Um, yeah, uh, actually, this is what uh, what uh, Mohamed Gonim's uh, master thesis uh, is about, um, uh, and uh, uh, at least one of the things he did is accurately. Uh, implement uh, both uh, partial bypassing and also uh, partial transmission uh, through the groin. Uh, so, um, in my first implementation, uh, the, uh, the, the, this was not, not, uh, not, not considered, but now he has done something really nice and, uh, and, and so the groin is, is, uh, is implemented uh, much more accurately. That code is not yet on the shorelines.nl uh, website, but we are in the process of merging everything and it will be there very soon. Mm -hmm. um, have you checked the sediment, <coughs> excuse me, have you, have you checked the sediment balance? Is it conservative? Um, if, uh, if the situation is not too complex, then, then uh, the scheme itself is, is, is totally conservative. Um, if we have like spits growing or islands moving, um, then uh, we need to do some smoothing. And the smoothing in, introduces uh, uh, as a, yeah, a, a mass conservation problem. That's sort of inevitable. Um, but uh, yeah, the, so the the trick is to 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 have that smoothing as small as possible. To to uh, but but uh, if if we can do without smoothing, then uh, then then the scheme is uh, is conservative. Yes. Saber wants to know if the model considers the soil properties. Um, well, they're not uh, not at the moment. Um, you would have to, to uh, in, include that in some way uh, in your description of the longshore transport. Huh? And, and uh, so, uh, okay. uh, or in some sort of, uh, what, what is uh, thinkable, uh, conceivable is to, to include like a cliff erosion uh, term. Uh, but then you have to, yeah, you would have to, to add that uh, as a function to the model. Um, have you validated shore lines with measured data, for instance, with, uh, again, satellite images? Yes, well, the example where we uh, looked in the, at this uh, San Luis case uh, was, was done against uh, satellite images. Um, yeah, so that is... Uh, uh, it is certainly possible, and and what I would like to to go to is is that we uh, can actually uh, uh, use a lot of uh, uh, coastline data uh, from from Google Earth, um, and then use that to automatically set up a model section and 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 do an automatic calibration even, and then uh, uh, use it to predict the future. Uh, so uh, we haven't made that operational yet, but the satellite data, as it is coming in now, for instance, through the Google Earth engine or the shoreline monitor of uh, of Deltares, uh, uh, that that is very useful uh, data to to uh, to set up and to to calibrate uh, a model. Can it be coupled to a model of? Um Aeolian transport, and again, I'm not sure about the pronunciation, but I suppose everybody else is. Yeah, well, the, so there's a wind-driven transport. Um, yes, so also Mohammed Gonin just built in a, a large part of a, a model presented by uh, Caroline Fredriksson and, and Magnus Larsen from Sweden. Um, and so we now have a description of both the, 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 the coastline, uh, let's say the zero water level line and, and the dune fruit line, and there's an eolian transport uh, process that, uh, that is in between. 
You could also uh, use the longshore transport uh, derived from shoreline S uh, to, to feed into a, a cross-shore profile model that includes eolian transport, such as the one that I uh, published this year with, uh, to, together with uh, Susanna Costas. Uh, uh, so that, that is a cross-shore model that includes a longshore transport gradient, and that gradient could come from shoreline S. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll now read out the next question, which is from Tu, uh, who says uh, that uh, she's looking for a model to predict shoreline changing in coastal Mekong Delta. Uh, I see it work well on Sandy Coast. I presume she means the model that she's using right now. Could I use your model to simulate shoreline changing in 5, 10 or 20 years in Mekong Delta? The coast is almost yeah. muddy. Uh, it can add sediment um, provided from the estuaries. Um, so yeah, well, it's a, it's a he. He's from uh, Tu, former student. Uh, hello, Tu. Um, I think um, we have been thinking about this uh, on the large scale. It 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 should be possible to. Uh, but we need to, to have an, an, a, a different uh, formulation for the, for the muddy sediment transport along the coast. Uh, but it's definitely something uh, we're very interested in, in, in developing also because we're involved in, in a large project in Bangladesh where, where the, the muddy transport from the Meghna to the, to the other estuaries is, uh, is one of the, the big issues. Uh, and I've seen that, uh, that uh, the, the, in principle, uh, if you have a good idea of the longshore transport of the mud, as we've seen with the, with the French uh, modelers who were involved in, in, in this project on the large scale erosion of, of the Mekong, um, uh, we see that, that if we take the gradients of that longshore mud transport, it correlates quite well with the coastline evolution. Uh, so um, I, I think there is scope for, for doing that. Okay. Um, the next question is from Jean again. Can the model cater to sandy beaches with vegetation that includes creepers and tall trees? Yes, and also uh, model intergalactic travel. Uh, no, uh, I, uh, I, I do think, uh, sorry, that's silly. Uh, of course, we do a lot of, of uh, uh, modeling of vegetation effects in two-dimensional and three-dimensional models. Um, uh, what I can see is that, uh, so how, how would shorelines see this is if these, these, uh, this vegetation reduces somehow uh, the longshore transport. Uh, so if we can find uh, some sort of a reduction factor uh, because of vegetation, uh, then, then we could, could model that in a, in a simple way. But you would have to, uh, to come up with a, with a formulation for that. Uh, I, I'm not aware of existing uh, formulations for bulk longshore transport due to vegetation, but maybe we could do some x beach simulations uh, with uh, various degrees of uh, vegetation and then define uh, some sort of uh, empirical uh, formulation uh, for it. Uh, we are three minutes over uh, our planned time, but I see that the questions, uh, they are still coming in. But unfortunately, we'll have to stop here. Uh, thank you so much, Dano. Uh, for your presentation and uh, for your very patient and detailed answering of the questions. And uh, thanks everyone for joining in, uh, for uh, listening to the presentation and uh, uh, for your great questions and comments. Uh, I'm not competent to provide a summary of this uh, you know, discussion. This is not my field of expertise and uh, like a large part of the discussion was much too technical for me. But what has caught my eye, what has caught my attention for me uh, the takeaway from this session is uh, something that perhaps we did not get to discuss that much in this session. But for me, the takeaway is uh, the fact 
that it is fascinating that Shorelines is being developed with an objective uh, that engaged citizens would be able to access it also. And uh, the fact that uh, this tool aspires to be open source, the fact that this tool is going to be open source, uh, I suppose will sort of multiply uh, its usefulness uh, all the more because uh, information will be crowdsourced and solutions will, will be crowdsourced and that will be good for coastal management. Uh, I would like to thank again Dano and thank everybody else and like uh, end with this uh, small pre-announcement uh, that uh, the next IHE uh, seminar uh, will be in September and uh, as to the exact date and the exact topic, uh, please uh, keep checking uh, the water channel and the IHE websites. Um, and the recording of this webinar will be available later today or tomorrow. Uh, on the landing page for this webinar, so the page from where we, you came here, uh, and I'll type it down also in the chat box, uh, channel.tv slash webinars. So on this... Oh, and, and maybe I can add something that if, if people have more questions, they can, uh, of course, they can just email me and, uh, sure. uh, and, and I'll be happy to, to answer. Great. Uh, could you please type in your email ID, Dano, in this chat box or somebody? That would be sure. helpful. There's now a message in front of my... <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, wait, 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 just, a, just a second. There it's coming. Okay. If okay. I'm able to... Yeah, click this. Yeah, so it's d.roving at un-ihe.org. Uh, no, or g. One, one G. Okay. Okay. Uh, we, yeah. There we have it. Okay. So uh, thanks, Dano. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you at the next webinar. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for attending.